Take your copy of God's Word, if you will, and turn to the book of James. James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. That is where we will settle in this morning and hear God's Word. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. We are people who experience contest. We are ex people who experience conflict. We are a people who experience battle. There are moments when those contests are welcomed, especially when you're on the winning side. This last week, we got to see Louisiana Tech University win a football game. That was a good night to be there and to root on the dogs. We got to see this week Rustin High win once again. We got to see Cedar Creek win as well. It's been a good week, if you will, in Lincoln Parish. Well, until yesterday, and our favorite team, Gramlin, lost, as well as a couple of other righteous schools across this nation. Sometimes the bad guys win, folks. Sometimes they win. But in so many different ways, we have contests. And in those arena certainly the field or maybe the court we have these spirited welcomed and even enjoyable types of competition but then we look around us and we see conflict and contest and strife that's much more difficult to deal with to be honest with you over the last few weeks it feels like that we have had a conflict with nature we've had nature itself bombard us and bring challenges to us in our areas and I say to you this morning that we need to continue to pray and we need to continue to give and we need to continue to do what we can to minister to those who are in well in the middle of a challenge and a strife right now those who've been impacted by Helene and those who have been impacted by Milton we want to continue to pray for those who feel like they're really in a battle. And we are grateful, by the way, for those who have deployed, a few of our members here, those at Rolling Hills who are there in Florida, who are helping to meet needs. We are grateful for that. We want to encourage and we want to pray for them as they're gone. Obviously, as you look across our national landscape, you'll also find political strife. And you will find a contest, a national election that's coming up. And my friends, I just say to you that one, we need to be praying that God would lead us and direct us in the right way. I pray that we as a people would participate and that we would make sure that we are not only allowing our voices to be heard, but we are voting when the time comes our biblical convictions. This is not a time for us to sit on the sidelines, but for us as God's people to continue to engage in the civic discourse and be a people who participate in what God has allowed us to experience here in this nation. So I say to you, pray and participate and trust the Lord. Because no matter what happens in November, I know a God that's still going to be on the throne. But we have these conflicts. We have all of these things that are going on around us. And I even even mentioned our, the international world in which we live. I mean, you could go overseas now into Europe, and unfortunately you can find a continued battle that's there, a continued war between Russia and Ukraine. And while we need to continue to pray for that and to pray for those in those war-torn areas, we're also, our hearts are drawn to the Middle East of where we see Israel itself engaged in what I believe is a moment of survival for them. As they deal with terrorists, and certainly, uh, as I've said, we pray for those who are innocent, that are getting caught up in all of the things, but at the same time, we understand that we as a people need, I believe, to be very supportive and encouraging to our, to our brothers and sisters in Israel. But there's so much going on. So many wars and conflicts. And look, I've just scratched the surface this morning. But what I want to talk to you about this morning is not so much what's going on in our nation, 
not so much that's going on internationally, but really what I want to address to you today is the war and the conflict that might be going on in your house or even the church house. Because in James chapter 4, he addresses the idea of wars and battles, and he brings it home to us. And he talks to us about battles that we're fighting, battles that we should not be fighting, battles that we're fighting with others, battles that we're fighting with ourselves, and battles that we are fighting with God. And he addresses these head on as he writes in James chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. But he who gives, gives more grace. Therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So he says, where are these wars and conflicts coming from? In particular, he says, where are they coming from? Those wars and battles and conflicts that are among you. Did you notice that? He is talking to this church that's been spread out, a church that's been persecuted, a church that has been dispersed. And as he's writing to them, he says, where are the wars and the conflicts that you are experiencing inwardly? Where are those coming from? You see... They were battling each other. They were battling other individuals within the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, this is a battle that we shouldn't be fighting. A battle where we are fighting one another. Where we are battling others that also claim the name of Christ. This is a battle that we should not be facing. This is a battle that we should not be fighting. And yet... James realizes that it is something that they are dealing with. Wars, a general terminology, talking about the overall conflict. He says these fights or these conflicts that are in you, these are like hand-to-hand, like street fights. I don't know about you, but you might have been a part of a church before where it looked like more of a street fight than a worship service. He says here, that you're having issues within the church. Now, at first, when you read that, you think to yourself, why would people in the church have issues with one another? When I was in high school and I began to serve at Blue Springs Baptist Church, where I was last week, when I was serving there and I began as I really was 14 when I first led my my first hymn there, and I sang my first special. Some of you remember the special. It wasn't too special when I would sing it. But anyway, when I would go there, I went there idealistically. I thought to myself, like, these are, these are Christians. These are people just like I'm supposed to be, who, like, we're all on the same page. We're all about the same mission. We're all about the same purpose. I mean, it's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. And while we had some wonderful moments, we had some tough, tough moments. James looks at this church and he says that you have wars, you have conflicts in your midst. You're battling one another. Again, the biblical testimony reminds us that the church has consistently had moments where there was strife. For example, if you read through the New Testament, you will often find letters, letters like Philippians or maybe 2 Thessalonians or even the Corinthian correspondence, which will speak to all of these difficulties that that early church was having. Think of this. 
These early churches had been discipled and planted, maybe by the Apostle Paul or some of the other apostles. And somehow, through all of that, they were still having issues. In particular, this last Wednesday night, we looked at the book of 1 Corinthians during prayer meeting and Bible study time. 1 Corinthians, they had this great division. There were people there that would say, I'm of Paul. And there were people who would say, I'm of Peter. And there were others who would say, I'm following Apollos. They were following personalities instead of the person of Jesus. And that's what happens, is that we get our eyes off of the person and we start focusing upon personalities. And yet there was division. There was division, as you see it in the biblical testimony. There's been division in the historical testimony of the church. But I would say to you, even this morning, as I've already related, that you and I would know that there's division experientially. That is, that we've experienced division within the local church before. Now, may I back up and say this. Thank God for the spirit of unity that has been and has continued to be at Temple Baptist Church. Some of you look at me and say, oh man, what's he preaching about this morning? You've already written a little note to your spouse saying, is he talking about somebody in particular? No, thanks be to the Lord, he has given us a spirit of unity. And he has. I, I, when I came here 11 years ago or so, I said, this can't be true. You know, I kept waiting for the other shoe to fall. You know what I'm saying? Because I knew that this was honeymoon time and maybe, maybe I'm just experiencing the good moments of unity. But somewhere along the line, you know, somewhere there's going to be division. I mean, I work with the staff, people like Jason Walsworth who create division all the time, right? So I was like, it's got to happen. It's got to happen. Well, thankfully, I've not seen it happen. So I guess 11 years in, I'm still into the honeymoon. I'm grateful. I hope the Lord leaves me into this season. So why would you preach this today, Reggie? Because, one, it is in the Scripture. And I hope that you know, if anything, that I'm going to take the Scripture and preach it just as the Scripture says. But number two, you and I need to be reminded of what could happen. And we need to constantly work toward unity and pray for unity. Because it can be a reality, if we're not careful, that Satan would divide us. I say Satan, but I'll show you in a moment. It's really ourselves. That would divide from one another. What I will only say to you is. Is that the biblical witness shows us that there can be division. The historical evidence and even our experience. Would, would remind us that there can be division. Let me come back again. When I went to Blue Springs uh, last week. And I got to preach. That was the first time I've been back in a long time. I think I left that church 26 years ago. I was but a babe. 26 years ago. It was funny because I would walk in and people would say, Hey, do you recognize me? Now, you know, people change a lot in 26 years. Not me. But they did. They would say, Brother Reggie, do you remember me? Do you remember me? And thanks be to God, he would give me a, a spirit of knowledge and it would allow that name to come to my mind so often. I think I got everybody correct. I didn't see anybody go off crying or anything like that. But I preached last week. I shared this Wednesday night, but I preached last week about how the enemy attacks at homecoming because this was homecoming service. And I'd really struggled with what to preach. Leslie will tell you, like, I'm not one of these to go back and, like, just regurgitate something I've done before. I just want the message to be the message for the moment, like this morning. Like, I want this to be the message for the moment. Let it speak now because this is what God wants to do. So I said, I just want to pray. So I went back and I studied different notes and I looked at different things and I read and I really struggled with it. But I did find myself back in the book of Nehemiah as I was just a few months ago. And I talked about the enemy attacking at homecoming. Because Nehemiah is a lot about homecoming. And of course, you know, there was the attack from the enemy. So I preached it, shared it. People began coming up to me afterwards and said, Do you know what's going on? I said, What are you talking about? Did the preacher talk to you? 
I said, look, the preacher called me about three months ago and asked me to do this. He told me he'd get back with me. No offense to him, but we preachers, we busy. He hadn't gotten back to me. I texted him on Friday and said, what time's the service? What should I wear? And what version do you use to preach out of? I said, that's all I know. They said, you didn't know anything else. I didn't know anything else. The pastor came up to me and said, I can't believe you just preached that message. I thought, I'm in trouble and never come back on this homecoming again. I said, why is that, Brother Gary? He said, he said, Reg, you just don't understand that, like, last week I was going to resign. I said, yeah. He said, yeah. He said, one of my deacons this morning is at home because he's mad at me. He's not even here. And I don't know what's going to happen with this church. I'm going to tell you that division can cause so much pain within a church. I saw it when I was there. I've seen it in other places. The battles, like the general sense of conflict, but also it seems the hand-to-hand -hand battle that can take place in churches. What was happening here in this, this church or these churches that James is writing to? Well, obviously, they're having some type of strife economically because, again, back in chapter 2, remember, he reminded them not to show partiality to people based upon their wealth or their lack of wealth. He said you shouldn't show partiality. In chapter 5, he'll actually call out those individuals who are taking advantage of others. So there's that strife between the, the economic classes. And let me just say to you, class warfare may be practiced by our culture. It shouldn't be. But certainly it should not be something that is evident and reflected in our churches. Never. But this is what's happening. Also what you find is a condemning spirit. Where do you find that? Like verse 11, verse 12 that I'll talk about in a few weeks. He says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. So in other words, they're having this evil uh, spirit of condemnation that's there. Where they're judging one another and condemning one another. In chapter 5, verse 9, he says, do not grumble against one another. So they were also, they had grumbling speech. So you see what's going on. If you put this all together, you can hear how they're having difficulties. Why again would you have difficulties? Because I told you a moment ago that when I went in at the age of 14, I thought, idealistically, I thought this is the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. We would never have a problem because we're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. At least we wouldn't have a problem among us. Well, maybe it's best framed when the professor said it to me this way. He said, Reggie, ministry would be easy if it weren't for people. And then he said, but there would be no ministry because there would not be people. You see, we're people. We're people. And we are a fallen people in the work of transformation, but we're still people. If you want to find a perfect church, I suggest to you that before you join it, you consider it. Because if you join that perfect church, you're going to mess it up. Because we are imperfect. And the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is imperfect. But I'm grateful that even in our imperfections and our issues, Jesus Christ still decided to die for us. To walk to the cross for us. And that he still holds out hope for us today. I am grateful for that. My friends, we need heavenly wisdom. My friend John King preached last Sunday, did an incredible job, didn't he? Amen. Well, that might hurt his feelings a little bit. I thought you might be a little more excited about it. But anyway, yeah, there you go. See, John, they, they're, they're giving you a little affirmation there. But he talked about true wisdom and fake wisdom in chapter 3. And remember, there were no, like, chapter divisions when James wrote. So what John preached on last week at the end of chapter 3 goes right along with the beginning of chapter 4. And what he said was, in verse 17, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. In other words, 
He says for us in our churches, we need to pray for wisdom. We need to, we need to stop battling with one another. And we need to pray for true heavenly wisdom in our lives so that we can know peace. Look, again, the culture would love to see us in chaos and confusion. You know why? Because when we're in chaos and confusion inwardly, we are no threat to them. But when we stand united, when we stand as the people of God who speak the word of God, who carry the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit, there is nothing, not even the gates of hell, that can stop us. But we need wisdom. We need wisdom. And we need to live united. Thanks be to the Lord that if you are a part of the local church, it does not matter your background, how much you make. It does not matter where you come from. It does not matter what you look like. But if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you and I can join together and work together for that which is good and that which is holy. And I'm grateful for that. But instead of battling one another, we should be bearing with one another. Because we're on the same team. I do dislike it when I watch a ball game and I see teammates begin jawing at each other. Especially when it's the team I'm rooting for. Because when I see that happening, I realize that something has transpired that has not just brought conflict, but now there can be a sense of disunity. And when you start hearing things come out of the locker room and all of that, you realize that that team is in serious trouble. Again, God has called us to be on the same team. And we're not to pick a fight with one another, but we're to stand together in the fight. So notice we are battling, we are battling one another in this passage. So he talks about that. He says in verse 1, where do they come from? And then in verse 1, he also shows how we're battling ourselves. He says, do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? This is what he says. He says, those battles that you're having outwardly in the church, it's because of the battles that you are having inwardly in your spirit. He said, in other words, that which you're seeing engaged in, that fight, that war out there, is because you are having a war inwardly. He said, do you not realize that all of these come from desires for pleasure that war in your members? Now, see, if I were to say, well, why, why are you having problems in the church? You say, well, you know that, you know that person. You know that individual. If you said that in your household... Let me just take it down to your family. I would say, now, why are you having problems? Well, you know my wife. Yeah, buddy, and I know you too. <laughs> we are quick to blame so many other people. We are quick. And what James says is James says that outward conflict that's in the church house, maybe in your house, it may be because there's conflict within you. It comes from you. It issues forth from you. Now, Paul described this type of conflict, did he not, so well in Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7, verse 15, for example, he said, For what I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Down in verse 19 of that same chapter, he said, For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Verse 23, But I see another law in my members. Hear that same language that Paul used, that James used? He says, I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body or this body of death? Paul experienced it. He said it's like an inward conflict. You realize that you can be saved and you can still have a conflict inside. That your heart, that your mind, that your thoughts, that they will battle with you. 
In verse 2 of James 4, he said, You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war. Notice he says, You lust and you do not have. You have this desire and you do not have. Now, again, in the original manuscripts, you don't have quite the punctuation marks, okay, here, that you do in our English translation. So he says, You lust and do not have. I actually think it stops there and he says, You murder or you kill. Because you lust and you do not have. Now, again, some of you just looked up. That's the first time you've listened to me the whole message. You just heard me say that. You said, what? They're killing people in the church? Remember what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5. Which, again, I've told you that James is what I call a reiteration of the sermon. And Jesus said... That when you call your brother Raka or you call your brother fool, that you are in the danger of judgment, even in the danger of hellfire itself. Why does he say that? He says, because you've always heard that it's about murder, about the physical act. But I say to you, it's about what you believe of other people and how you've already determined them to be worthless in your own mind. So here, I'm not sure that they have actually had murder take place as as we would understand it in the church but what they have had is that people have slandered other people and have destroyed their character and all of these other things and he says it is because of this desire this lust that you've had this battle that you have on the inside because you want more and more and more and you seem not to be able to obtain it you look around and you think Oh, look at what they're doing in the church. Look at what they are and who they are. Look at what they're accomplishing. Or maybe what they have. And you so want it that you are willing to do anything to get it. He said, this is the war that you're having inside. Again, going back to that passage that Brother John preached last week. In chapter 3, verse 16, he said... For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. In other words, when you are envious toward other people, when it's about your selfish ambition, then there is confusion. You're going to battle with others because you're battling with yourself. Because you have an internal battle. And you're frustrated. You're frustrated. I don't know about you, but I can get frustrated from time to time. Okay, I'm out on a limb here by myself. There was no amen at all in that one. Some of you just looked at me like, hmm. Friends, I'll tell you, I get frustrated. I get frustrated all the time. Usually when I'm frustrated, it is because I have been battling with myself over something in my heart, in my life, my thought life, my heart life. Notice what he says. He says, you fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, that you may spend it on your pleasures. He said, in other words, it affects who you are even in your relationship to God and how you're praying. Some of you don't even pray because you're just trying to seek it on yourself. And then when you do pray, you ask amiss. In other words, your heart is not postured right toward the Lord. It's about what you want, not about what he wants. See, we go to God with the right lips often, but we just don't go to him with the right heart. We, we, we come and we can say the right things, but our heart is far from him. God, I need you. God, I want this. God, I need this. Why do you want that? Why do you need that? Is it because of your own pleasure or is it because of the pleasure and the will of God? He says, you're battling With yourself. And listen, that battle, it can be so destructive when we're battling and we give in to our hearts and our thoughts. Because why again, the heart is deceitful above all things, desperately wicked. Who can know it? But those things crawl in and they try to infiltrate us. Now I am old enough to remember that tragic and horrible day that we commonly refer to simply as 9-11. 19 terrorists 
19, somehow found their way on commercial airlines. On four different commercial airlines, they found themselves. And before the crew could even realize it or know what was going on, they had already taken charge of those planes and they were flying them. We remember the tremendous devastation. They're in New York, they're at the Pentagon, even the airline that went down in Pennsylvania. It was tough to imagine that this could happen. Such a coordinated attack that they could somehow commandeer four different airplanes. But you realize, my friends, that's what our thoughts and hearts try to do to us every day. Before we know it, they're trying to, they're trying to navigate your course. Before you know it, they're in the cockpit and they're flying. And when they take control, when they take control, they will lead you into a place of destruction. Because it, they love to infiltrate your life. Lust. Pleasure, those things are not bad in, of, in and of themselves. Desires are not. But when they are not met by the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, something is wrong. What can we do then? You say, shouldn't we battle those? Well, let me tell you, you can't battle those on your own. If anything you hear from me every Sunday, it should be this. You cannot battle your own sin and your own lust and your own desires on your own. You cannot do that. If you think you can, Satan has already deceived you and you're on a path of destruction. When Paul wrote and he said, who will deliver me from the death of this body? This is what he said in chapter 7 of Romans, verse 24. He answered his question in verse 25 and he said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He continued on in chapter 8, verse 1. He said, There is therefore now no condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You know how you can overcome that? You can overcome those things through the work of the Lord Jesus in your life and through the power of the Spirit which dwells within you each and every day. Thanks be to God for that. Thanks be to God that he can write the same Paul right to the Colossian believers and he will say to them in chapter 3 verse 5 therefore put to death your members notice that same language put to death your members which are on the earth fornication uncleanness passion evil desire and covetousness which is idolatry he says because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them he said, you can put to death those things. You don't have to battle those things constantly. You can put them to death. How? Through Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit in your life. I'm not saying that they won't come back. Oh, they'll come back and they'll try to drive you off course. But I'm telling you that you still have the power of Christ. If I didn't believe that you and I could live differently, if I didn't believe that you and I could be changed and transformed, I would walk from this pulpit and I never again would come back to it. Because there would be no reason to give messages week after week. There'd be no reason to open the scripture. There'd be no reason if we didn't believe that we could be transformed and different. But I tell you that we can be. And that is the reason James writes. It is the reason Paul writes. It is the reason that the writers of scripture spoke to us. Because we can be different through Jesus who leads us and guides us. You and I are free. And instead of battling with ourselves, we should simply break with our old self and start being our new self in Jesus. But unfortunately, what I would show you here at the end is this. Sometimes we're not only battling, we're not only battling each other, but we're battling ourselves and we are battling God. Look in verse 4. Adulterers and adul adulteresses. Wow. Wow. That's a way to get off to a good start with them, isn't it? If I had gotten up this morning and said, Hey, I just want to speak to you out there, you all, uh, you who have committed adultery. 
Some of you would have looked at me like, how did he just start that sermon? You think, why would James use such powerful and strong language? Well, listen to what he says. Do you not know that friendship, actually that word friendship is that uh, original word phileo, which means like love, like Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. It is the idea of like you have a fondness or a love toward the world. He said, don't you know that that is enmity with God? You are an enemy of God. You are in hostility to God. You are fighting God. You are battling God. That's the reason he uses strong language. See, God has entered into a special relationship with his people. Read the, book, read the Old Testament. You will see in Isaiah, Jeremiah, especially that analogy in Hosea, that you will see the idea of where God has brought in the people of Israel as his bride. That he is betrothed to them. He is married to them. It is that idea that we're in this special relationship. Do you realize that same terminology is used in the New Testament as Jesus will be the bridegroom and the church will be the bride? So that is, there's a sense of where we are in this special relationship with Jesus. Last night, I was in Baton Rouge. Thank God I was not at that debacle but I was actually celebrating what we should be celebrating, a marriage. I was just south of Baton Rouge, around Gonzales, at a beautiful setting called Homer's House. I did that wedding at 6 p.m. last night, drove home, and said, you're just going to have to get what you get on Sunday morning. You know what I'm saying? I stood there with this couple, wonderful couple, couple, a family that I've known for so many years, and here we are, and yes, everybody gets dressed up, and it's beautiful, it's a wonderful setting, and wonderful big oak trees, and everybody has on their best, and, and it is wonderful, it is wonderful, but what is the purpose? The purpose is for these two to commit themselves before the Lord Jesus Christ. Right before we walked out, the young man, the groom, looked at me, and he said, he said, Brother Reggie, I know we're not getting married in a church. I know we're getting married out here, but this is okay, right? This is, I started to say, you should have asked me that a few weeks ago. It's kind of the wrong time when we're about to walk out. I said, let me tell you something. Whether you get married in a church or a venue or wherever else, the key is that you are making a commitment before the Lord Jesus Christ to your bride that you are committing before God. Because let me tell you, I told him, I said, Wesley, God is here. And he will hear everything that you say today. And the vow and the oath that you make is a vow and oath that you make before your bride, but also before God and before all of those who are here. I said, you are entering into this marriage, and I promise you, it's going to be fine if you follow him. When you and I accept the Lord Jesus, when we commit ourselves, when we walk the aisle and we say, we want to be a part of the kingdom, or maybe when we go through the waters of baptism and we've communicated that we've already accepted Christ as our Savior, when we've done that, listen to me, it is the idea that we've entered into an exclusive relationship with Jesus Christ. And just in marriage, like there should be no outside influence that comes in to try to rock the marriage or to somehow disrupt the marriage in your relationship with Jesus, there should be nothing else, nothing else that would take priority over your relationship with him. Nothing. That is the reason he uses that strong language that you are adulterous. Why? Because what they have done is that they have, they have battled other believers, they have battled themselves, and they have allowed lust and all of these things to win in their lives, and now they have compromised themselves with the world. And he says, you're being unfaithful. And if you're being unfaithful, you have set yourself against the God of heaven. Instead of being in an exclusive, wonderful relationship with him where you know intimacy and joy, you have set yourself against him with hostility. What is that compromise with the world? 
Some of you look at me and say, I thought we were supposed to love the world. The Bible says that God so loved the world. Listen, what he's talking about here is a world that is defined as a system that is set against him. And this is what Paul said to the Romans. As he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable in the perfect will of God. Why? Because the spirit yearns jealously for you. Look, I always had a little issue when I was coming up of trying to understand Exodus 25 where God said that he was jealous. Because I always heard jealousy is terrible. Like, you're not supposed to be jealous. Why would God be jealous? God's supposed to be holy. You know why God has a right to be jealous? Because he is the only one that has exclusive right over your life and my life. You know why he's jealous? Because he loves you so much. You know why he's jealous? Because he is determined to have you. Determined. Think of that. Isn't that awesome? That the God of heaven is determined to have you. Because he loves you so much. And he wants you to know the experience of intimacy and spiritual growth. It is the reason he says in verse 6, but he gives more grace. Even in the midst of all of it, our God is the giver of greater grace than we could ever imagine. He still gives grace. My friends, what I would say to you is stop fighting him. Stop battling him. But rather, trust him. In chapter 2, verse 23, Abraham was called a friend of God. You know why? Because he believed. Trust him. Come to him. Give him all of who you are. Stop, Stop battling God and start believing God. And allow yourself to be found in that peaceful, joyful relationship with him. Folks, I don't know what's going on. At your house. Maybe right now it's conflict. Maybe right now it looks like a war zone. Sometimes I don't even know what's going on at the church house. I think there's unification. But but what I would say to you today. Is we need to stop fighting battles. That we never should have been fighting. And we need to surrender ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. And trust him. Some of you are where you are because you're fighting him right now. And I tell you that this day, on this Sunday, October the 13th, here in this place, it is a time to lay down your arms and accept the Lord Jesus Christ just as he said he was the Lord of your life. Would you give yourself to him? Would you stop fighting? Would you stop battling? And would you trust him for a relationship of love and intimacy? Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning. We pray even now that you would work, that you would speak, that you would make a difference. Even in this moment of commitment and invitation. Thank you for who you are in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?